Good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center as our pre-flight briefings continue for the STS-135 ULF-7 mission to the International Space Station. This is the mission overview briefing and with us today are the two gentlemen who will preside over the final flight of Atlantis and the last flight in the space shuttle program's history. To my left, Quatsi Alaburujo, the lead space shuttle director, flight director for STS-135, and to his left, Chris Edelin, the lead space station flight director for ULF-7. And we'll start off with Quatsi. Thank you, Rob. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, it's my honor to be here to talk to you about the details of this final flight of the space shuttle Atlantis, uh, the STS-135 mission, uh, her cargo and her crew. Uh, the primary objectives of this mission, of course, uh, as you heard from our program management, uh, are to bring the multi-purpose logistics module to the International Space Station, uh, to provide some resupply and logistics to set the space station up for uh, continued operations uh, through the end of 2012, as well as to uh, return uh, a failed component, the external control system, uh, thermal control system pump module from the ISS, and to deploy uh, a special payload, the robotics refueling mission module, uh, which is a technology demonstration uh, uh, payload that uh, has been developed by Goddard Space Flight Center. We'll have more details on on this aspect of the mission uh, in uh, in the moments to come. If we could have uh, the still of the STS-135 crew, we we have an awesome crew for this mission. Uh, veteran space flyers, uh, commanded by Chris Ferguson, uh, retired captain, the U.S. Navy, veteran of space flights STS-115, STS-126. Also, pilot uh, Doug Hurley, who's uh, Colonel U.S. Marine Corps and a veteran of uh, STS-127. You have Dr. Sandy Magnus, uh, who is uh, an experienced shuttle and space station crew member, previously flown on STS-112, STS-126, and uh, she was flight engineer on Expedition 18 and returned home on STS-119. And then also we have uh, veteran spacewalker Rex Walheim, who uh, flew on STS-110 as well as STS-122. The crew patch for this mission, which you can see in uh, another still, is a very special one, very symbolic. Uh, it symbolizes and pays tribute to the legacy of the space shuttle program as well as the contributions of the civil servant and contractor workforce that have contributed to the space shuttle. You see Atlantis there in the center of the patch uh, embarking on her mission, uh, set over elements of the NASA emblem, and uh, particularly powerful is the Omega, which is prominently figured in, uh, prominently featured in the in the uh, the image, to symbolize the end of the program, as Omega is the last letter of the the Greek alphabet. And I think this patch really summarizes the the legacy of the shuttle program as well as the uh, significance of of this particular mission. Let me tell you a little bit about the flight director team that will be supporting uh, space shuttle operations on this flight. Uh, as the lead shuttle flight director, I'll be on the Orbit 1 team, as is traditional. Uh, we also have uh, Ascent Flight Director Richard Jones, and you'll see a picture of him uh, there in still photograph. Working Orbit 2 uh, will be Flight Director Rick LeBrode, who's uh, also a highly experienced space shuttle flight director. Our planning shift will be presided over by uh, uh, senior Space Shuttle Flight Director, Mr. Paul Dye, uh, who has uh, flown more Space Shuttle missions than uh, anyone currently in the office. And then our Team 4 Flight Director, this is the gentleman who will, uh, who will help lead, uh, lead special support teams in re resolution of any uh, intractable problems, which of course we hope we don't have, and that'll be Mr. Gary Horlocker. Uh, he'll be presiding over our, uh, over our Team 4. And then Entry Flight Director, uh, Tony Sakachi. He will uh, handle the team that will be presiding over Atlantis's final deorbit entry and landing. So this is a, an excellent flight director team to go along with uh, an outstanding crew uh, that will very capably perform all of the mission objectives for uh, STS-135. And I personally am very excited about working not only with our crew, but also with the, uh, the other flight directors and flight controllers that will be supporting the mission. Just to show you uh, how Atlantis's payload bay is configured, uh, let's have the first video and uh, you can see the various elements of the payload bay. Here you've got uh, Atlantis's payload bay in its final configuration. 
On the forward end of the spacecraft, you see the orbiter docking system, which will allow it to mate to the International Space Station. We also have featured prominently the uh, shuttle remote manipulator. And on the other side of the spacecraft is the uh, orbiter boom sensor system, which will be used to inspect the, the thermal protection system of Atlantis. Underneath the uh, OBSS, you see uh, a canister, which will be used to deploy the PicoSat solar cell uh, experiment after undocking. And there, of course, is uh, our cargo carrier, the multipurpose logistics module. And aft of the MPLM, we have the LMC lightweight MPEZ carrier, which I'll give you some more detail of. You see, the uh, LMC is essentially a truss, uh, which is specially equipped to uh, carry cargo. On the underside of the LMC is the robotic refueling mission. It's a cube-shaped uh, orbital refueling demonstration payload. And then you see where the uh, failed EC ETCS pump module will return after we retrieve it from the ISS. That will fly home in Atlantis's payload bay. So that's how the spacecraft is configured. And uh, we are, are highly confident that we'll be able to get all of the uh, cargo deployed properly. And uh, we have a, an excellent team that's worked hard to be able to do that. Just to give you an overview of, uh, of the activities on the mission, starting with flight day one, We'll be conducting our normal launch ascent, uh, ascent imagery activities as you've come to expect. Uh, we'll be deploying laptops uh, to provide uh, access to uh, special files, updates to the flight plan, changes to the execute package, and uh, procedures that we'll be updating for the crew during the mission. We'll also be activating the uh, robotic arm and checking it out, making sure that it's prepared to conduct the, uh, the thermal protection system inspections on the following day and then we'll do uh, our standard ohms pod survey. On flight day two is when we'll conduct our TPS inspections and we have another video to show you to illustrate how that will be done. Here you see the robotic manipulator uh, grappling the orbiter boom sensor system. The orbiter boom sensor system, the OBSS, will then be maneuvered into position to start survey of the uh, starboard wing. There, the various sensor packages on the OBSS, which include uh, high-resolution still camera, a later laser uh, range imager, as well as a video camera, will uh, sweep over the critical surfaces of uh, Atlantis's thermal protection system, looking for any imperfections, uh, any damage that might have been caused by ascent debris, or uh, anything that might compromise uh, Atlantis's capability to perform a safe re-entry. After inspecting the uh, wing leading edge and also uh, areas of the payload bay door, uh, the uh, OBSS will inspect the nose cap, which is also made of the same reinforced carbon-carbon material uh, that's on the leading edge of the wings. Once that inspection is complete, uh, the OBSS will then move to the port wing and conduct similar inspections of the thermal protection system there again looking for imperfections, looking for orbital debris damage, ascent debris damage, and anything that uh, we might need to go address and remediate. We'll conclude by in inspecting the port uh, payload bay door, as well as uh, some of the areas uh, where umbilicals were attached prior to launch. We expect this inspection to take uh, most of the day on flight day two. As uh, Mr. Shannon alluded to, it will be uh, challenging to get through that inspection uh, with the reduced crew complement, but uh, this crew has practiced considerably uh, to be able to develop a, a flow or a routine, if you will, uh, to where even though they have fewer hands uh, available in the shuttle, they'll be able to get through these inspections uh, with, uh, with confidence and within the time frame that's been allotted for them, and then berth and stow the OBSS as you see there. After the conclusion of the Flight Day 2 uh, thermal protection system inspections, uh, the crew will complete the checkout of the various tools that assist them with rendezvous and docking. And the very next day, they'll engage in uh, Atlantis's final rendezvous and docking with the International Space Station. We have a video to illustrate the final phases of that rendezvous and docking. Uh, we expect uh, Atlantis to uh, arrive on uh, the R bar or just underneath the space station. ISS crew members will, uh, will then prepare to take uh, photographic high-resolution imagery uh, with 400, 800, and also 1,000 millimeter lenses. 
This will help us uh, evaluate uh, other areas of the Atlantis' thermal protection system that we were not able to see uh, with the, uh, the orbiter boom sensor system. And it will also help us, uh, help us assess the, uh, the capability of the spacecraft to perform a safe reentry. Once uh, Atlantis' final uh, RPM maneuver or uh, ARBAR pitch maneuver is complete, Atlantis will maneuver to what we call the V-bar, which is basically putting it uh, out in front of the uh, space station. And then Commander Chris Ferguson will, uh, will guide Atlantis to her final approach and docking with the ISS. Again, uh, with the reduced crew complement, the, uh, the, the deployment of the crew on the cockpit will be uh, a little bit uh, different, but uh, they've been able to get a good flow, and we've rehearsed this rendezvous scenario several times with the crew, and uh, we are, are excited to, uh, to engage in this final rendezvous with the International Space Station. Uh, we think it'll be a great day, and we think we'll uh, get some great imagery of the shuttle on her final approach. After hatch opening, uh, we'll hand off the uh, the OBSS to the uh, to the uh, the space station robotic arm. We do have a video of that uh, brief clip that we'll show you, and that's basically to uh, get the orbiter boom sensor system out of the way, uh, so that uh, when we get ready to unberth and install the MPLM, uh, we'll be able to uh, avoid uh, any risk of of uh, colliding with the uh, the structure of the the OBSS. So essentially, uh, the shuttle's, the station's robotic arm, excuse me, will uh, grapple the OBSS and hand it off to the space shuttle robotic arm, where the space shuttle robotic arm will then uh, essentially move the OBSS to uh, a benign uh, camera viewing position where uh, that part of the boom will be uh, well clear of any structure uh, that, that, uh, that might be in the way as the MPLM is removed from the payload bay and installed. At that point, uh, we'll begin the docked phase of the mission and uh, all of the, uh, the objectives that are uh, encompassed in that phase. And I'll hand it over to my associate, Mr. Chris Edelin, to tell you more about that. Thank you, Quatsi. Uh, first, let me say I think it's quite fitting that this, the final flight of the shuttle, is exactly the type of missions that, it, that, that its designers originally intended, and that is to service a manned laboratory in low Earth orbit. The uh, this is the 37th flight of the shuttle to the space station, and the first flight was back in 1988 when Endeavour delivered the first uh, U.S. element and uh, attached it to the first Russian element that had been launched. So here we are, 13 years later, the, the space station is now over 900,000 pounds. It's, uh, it's bigger than a football field from end to end. It's home to a multinational crew of six performing cutting-edge research in biology and medical science, astronomy, physics. Uh, fluid and material science. So uh, the, the, the space station uh, largely has been lifted into orbit by the space shuttle. It's been assembled by spacewalking crews from the space shuttle, and it's been resupplied by the space shuttle over the years. So uh, uh, the space station literally would not have been possible without the contribution of the space shuttle. So uh, again, the main purpose of uh, STS-135 is logistics, bringing up the supplies that will provision the space station through the year 2012. That's a key date because um, our commercial cargo providers are going to be coming online in early 2012, and by uh, providing the supplies we need to get through all of next year, uh, that will provide a little bit of uh, a breathing room for the development as those uh, companies and spacecraft enter their challenging flight test phase. And of course, our crews will continue to be rotated to and from the space station using Soyuz spacecraft uh, provided by the Russians. We, uh, we've been doing that exclusively on Soyuz for space station crews for the past couple years, uh, in part because the Soyuz serves as the lifeboat uh, for the crews when they're on the space station. So let me uh, introduce you to the current residents of the space station. If you can put the graphic up, please. This is the crew of Expedition 28 currently on the station, and they'll be the crew members uh, greeting Atlantis when she arrives uh, in July. Starting from the left is Satoshi Furukawa of the Japanese Space Agency. He's a medical doctor, and uh, Expedition 28 is his first space flight. Next to him is NASA astronaut Mike Fossum. He's a retired colonel from the US Air Force. He's an Eagle Scout and an active scoutmaster here in the, with a troop here in the Houston area. Mike was mission specialist on STS-121 and 124, and he has done three spacewalks on STS-124. 
And next to Mike is Ron Guerin. He's a former F-16 pilot, and he was, uh, his previous flight experience was as mission specialist on STS-124 uh, with Mike Fossum, and he actually performed three of those spacewalks with Mike. Next to Ron is cosmonaut Alexander Samoyakotayev. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Russian Air Force and a flight engineer on Expedition 27 and 28. Then next to him, second from the right, is Sergei Volkov. He's also a colonel in the Russian Air Force. He's the former commander of Expedition 17 back in 2008. And he's also the commander of the 26, uh, or correction, the 27S Soyuz vehicle uh, that uh, he flew up with Ron and Mike. And they arrived at the space station in early June. And finally, on the right is the Expedition 28 commander, Andrei Borisienko. And he's the former flight director uh, from the uh, Russian Flight Control Center in Moscow, and he's been supporting uh, space station operations since early April. And he's the, uh, he's the commander of the 26S Soyuz with, uh, with Ron and Alexander, and I believe I have a correction on uh, uh, Sergei Volkov is the 27S commander, and he flew up with Mike and Satoshi. So that's our crew on the space station. They've been very busy the past couple weeks preparing for STS-135's arrival. They've been gathering the cargo that's going to be returned in the uh, multi-purpose logistics module. They've been checking out their spacesuits. They, they did a dress rehearsal last week to uh, assess the fit of their spacesuits and practice some of their procedures. They've been doing a lot of self-study to prepare for the spacewalk. And uh, for example, this morning, they uh, swapped out the air conditioner in node two, the Harmony module. Uh, in order to prepare the heat exchanger and that air conditioner for return on the shuttle. So supporting the, uh, the space station crew will be uh, uh, three flight control teams in the space station control room. Uh, I'll be leading the Orbit 2 team. We'll be uh, running things from the uh, midday during the crew day towards uh, uh, their, their pre-sleep time frame. Uh, if we put up the graphic, uh, Jerry Jason is our Orbit 1 flight director. He'll be uh, leading the team during the crew morning from a couple hours before wake up until the midday meal. And then Courtney McMillan is our Orbit 3 flight director. She'll be in charge of the planning team. They'll uh, watch over the vehicle while the crew's asleep at night and replan the next day's activities. So back to the timeline. Where we left off was uh, the end of flight day three. We had the shuttle safely docked. The, uh, the OBSS uh, transferred to the, to the shuttle arm. And now we can get into the, uh, the, the, the joint mission, flight day four, our first full joint day of the mission. We'll commence the cargo transfer operations. We'll be transferring first uh, about 2,100 pounds of cargo from the mid-deck of Atlantis over to the space station. And then we'll prepare to, to install the uh, Raffaello multipurpose logistics module on the station. Now, the type of cargo that we're bringing up is just the type of thing any, any of you would, would plan for if you were in charge of outfitting a research station at some remote location, such as Antarctica. We're bringing up uh, crew supplies, such as food and clothing. We're also bringing up critical spare parts uh, for, for any uh, unanticipated failures. And we're also bringing up uh, science supplies and experiments. So just to run down through some of the specific numbers, uh, in the multipurpose logistics module, uh, we'll be carrying up 8,150 pounds of cargo. And the totals, including Raffaello and the mid-deck, for food and crew support items is 2,680 pounds and 4,340 pounds of spare parts for the station and 1,780 pounds of science gear for utilization. And just a couple specific examples there. Uh, one of the new spare parts that we're bringing up uh, uh, it, it, to enhance our urine recycling system is the advanced recycle filter tank assembly. Our current filters that are used to, to, to filter urine and, and turn that into drinking water that can be used over and over again, is uh, these are throwaway filters that they're used only once. They're either discarded or brought back to earth and, and refurbished. The advanced filter tank assembly will allow us to, to reuse the hardware over and over again. We'll essentially take the brine, the yucky stuff, and offload that into disposable uh, canisters or uh, the, uh, the waste tanks of Progress spacecraft and then dispose of that. So, so essentially, the advanced uh, RAFTA, as it's called, will, will uh, allow us to, uh, to, to decrease our reliance on ground resupply. Another example is the Amine swing bed. This is a, this is a CO2 scrubber. It's an advanced uh, demonstrator for, for new uh, ways to scrub carbon dioxide from the air. It's to, uh, to demonstrate technology that we'll need for, for future spacecraft. 
And also, we're bringing up an ultrasound machine. This will be used for uh, studies to determine the effects of uh, microgravity on the astronauts' physiology. There's a lot of applications uh, for this study because the, the astronauts' bones and muscles tend to degrade over time, similar to how uh, what occurs to people on Earth when they're subject to bed rest or the elderly with osteoporosis. So uh, we're bringing up a lot, of, uh, a lot of really interesting gear for technology demonstration and scientific study. So next, I'd like uh, to show you a view of the multipurpose logistics module. We have a video of the MPLM at the uh, Space Station Processing Facility at KSC. The, uh, the MPLM is uh, built in Italy. It was last flown on STS-114 back in 2005. And you can see inside the module there are, there are attach points where standard-sized racks are mounted. And you can see the racks across the top of the view there. We'll be flying three different types of racks. They're each about the size of a refrigerator. And in this graphic, uh, the first type is the uh, resupply uh, stowage rack on the top and bottom there. Those are essentially drawer-type racks used for small items such as food and clothing. You can think of that essentially as your dresser drawer in your bedroom. On the sides there, we have uh, resupply stowage platforms that are used to hold oversized cargo, so that specifically our spare parts. And then at the top there was a view of another uh, flat supply platform, the International uh, Standard Payload uh, Rack, which again is used for oversized uh, payload type items. On the end cone, we're going to have 12 crew transfer bags mounted. So again, a view back inside the MPLM, you can see some of the transfer racks uh, that are mounted in the, in the module, again, that are used to hold the cargo. Here's an example of a, a cargo transfer bag getting ready to be loaded in by the technicians. And that's the, uh, the end cone of the logistics module. And we have several, uh, uh, again, 12 of those bags uh, will include food, clothing, GPS antennas, and some spare printers. Here's an example of the uh, resupply stowage platform. You can see the, uh, the back side of that platform is loaded with cargo. Again, inside those transfer bags are uh, spare parts. Uh, they're packed in foam and then put into a Nomex uh, transfer container. They're secured onto the platform and then a special machine loads it into the MPLM. Once it's, uh, and, and just to give you a couple specific examples of the car, the spare parts there that are gonna be on the, the vertical platforms are, we have a new distillation assembly for our urine processor, we have a new gyro for the Tevis treadmill, and uh, a new charcoal bed coming up for our air purifier. And here's the technicians installing one of the uh, spare parts on the front side of the rack, and on orbit, basically, it'll be the opposite process. The crew will unload the front side first and then tilt the rack to access the back side. Here's our crew at Kennedy Space Center earlier this month. They came down to inspect the module and the cargo and to review their, their transfer plan. And on June 13th, the module was uh, completely loaded. Hatch was closed and sealed up. And then it was inserted into the payload canister for the trip to the launch pad. So on June 20th, Raffaello was delivered to the launch pad. You can see Atlantis there. It was lifted up into the uh, rotating service structure, and this is, this is a really neat process because the, the module is, is extracted from the payload canister into the room there in the, uh, in the backside of the uh, rotating service structure. And then the entire, that entire gray structure is rotated over to cover the payload bay. And then in a clean environment, the shuttle payload bay doors are opened, and the MPLM was transferred into the payload bay. So uh, that's where Raffaello is right now, awaiting launch. The weight of the logistics module is 25,400 pounds. That's the second heaviest MPLM that we've launched. But uh, we are carrying the most cargo on this flight uh, than we've ever carried before in an MPLM. So uh, next I'll show you a video of how we get Raffaello from the payload bay onto station, if you can roll that video. This will be the morning of flight day four. Our robotics operators Sandy Magnus and Doug Hurley will be located in this cupola on the space station where you see the blinking windows. They have a, uh, the controls there to drive the station robotic arm, the Canada Arm 2. They'll move in and grasp the MPLM and carefully extract it from the payload bay. This is the view that Doug and Sandy will see when they're working in the, uh, in the cupola. You can see they, they have uh, uh, good views out the window. They also have closed circuit TV that they'll be using. They'll maneuver the module uh, up to the node two or harmony node 
Uh, the earth-facing port there, they'll maneuver it into position so that the common berthing mechanism uh, latches just a few inches from the interface. That there are, will be four latches that will grab the module and will pull it in to, uh, to connect the MPLM to the station. Then the crew will drive 16 bolts to secure the MPLM and, uh, and, and get an airtight seal. After, after that, uh, Sandy and Doug will maneuver the arm to the uh, start position for EVA uh, the next day. So after the MPLM is firmly attached to the station, the crew will go into node two and they'll open that lower earth-facing hatch. Uh, then they will perform what we call vestibule outfitting. They'll connect the electrical data and power jumpers so that they can activate the, uh, the MPLM. They'll also install air ducting and then they'll actually open the hatch, go into Raffaello and, and begin the, uh, the, the cargo transfer process. Meanwhile, uh, our spacewalkers for the next day uh, Mike Fossum and Ron Guerin will be working with Rex Walheim, transferring the cargo that they need for the spacewalk from the mid-deck of Atlantis into the space station. They'll be doing their final tool verification. And then at the end of the day, the entire crew will have an EVA conference to review the, uh, the timeline for the EVA. So that takes us to flight day five. And the focus of flight day five will be the EVA itself. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on how we're going to conduct this, this will be the first shuttle mission where the EVA is performed by the space station crew. The reason we did that is because with a, a small shuttle crew of four, we wanted to offload the training uh, tasks on the shuttle crew and sort of level the load. So we took advantage of the, the EVA experience of uh, Mike Fossum and Ron Guerin. As I mentioned before, they've actually done three spacewalks together on a previous shuttle mission. So. Um, uh, Mike and Ron together um, were able to get up to speed very quickly on this EVA, and, uh, and that way we relieved the shuttle crew from having to also add that to their very busy training schedule. Now, uh, during the spacewalk, the, the, again, it'll be Mike and Ron going outside, but supporting them in the, uh, in the space station will be, again, Sandy Magnus and Doug Hurley driving the station robot arm to support the EVA. Uh, Chris Ferguson and Satoshi Furukawa will be assisting with uh, uh, Mike and Ron getting in and out of their suits before and after the EVA. And Rex Walheim will be on the aft flight deck of Atlantis overseeing the EVA and uh, providing the, uh, the EV crew members specific instructions and choreography on the EVA as, the, as they go through the six and a half hour spacewalk. Um, just to give you uh, an overview of what the primary objectives are, we are going to return the, uh, the uh, failed pump module it's an ammonia pump module that supports the space station external thermal control system. This failed back uh, on July 30th uh, last year. I remember because I was on console when it failed. It was one of those moments where on a, a, a quiet Saturday and the crew's off duty and getting ready to go to bed and everything's going real well and then it, it all changed in a second when that, that pump module failed. All the uh, caution and warnings started going off and, and the ground and the crew had to very quickly scramble to reconfigure uh, the, the systems and, and power down some of the systems in order to keep the shuttle uh, limping along on one remaining uh, cooling loop. We have two, two loop cooling loops on the space station. So that was a, a major failure in, in, the, uh, in the history of the space station program. It was the first major failure that required uh, spacewalks uh, without a shuttle present to fix the problem. It actually took three spacewalks to, uh, to remove the failed pump module and install the new one. And that was actually, those uh, spacewalks were actually led by one of the flight directors on our team, the Orbit 3 flight director, Courtney McMillan. So uh, on STS-133, just re earlier this year, that pump module was moved into position on external stowage platform number two. It has been vented of all its ammonia. It's now an inert uh, uh, payload, essentially, that will be brought back on the shuttle. And we'll be very interested to see, uh, to examine that and to see what exactly uh, was the failure mechanism. We do have spares on orbit still, but we'd, uh, we do want to understand uh, what happened with the pump module. Our next major objective with the EVA, as Quatsi mentioned, is to install the robotics refueling mission. We can roll that video. This is, again, it's a technology demonstrator uh, to demonstrate the, the techniques and the tools and the procedures that will be used to perform in-flight refueling of satellites. The, what we're going to do during the EVA is that the crew is going to remove it from that LMC bridge. They're going to install it on the outside of the station. And then over the next two years, our uh, SPDM, our special purpose, multi, uh, special purpose dexterous manipulator, or Dexter, uh, will, will 
use the tools there in RRM to practice uh, and demonstrate the techniques to perform orbital refueling. There's even a uh, simulated liquid fuel system in RRM that Dexter is going to actually use to transfer fuel between tanks. Another objective of the EVA is to install the uh, ORMATE uh, uh, stowage platform. ORMATE stands for Optical Reflector Materials Experiment. These are uh, samples of various optical materials and we want to, uh, scientists want to understand how uh, exposure to the space environment affects those materials. This actually went up uh, recently on STS-134, but because its mounting location is close to the uh, AMS, the Alpha Magn Magnetic Spectrometer, there was a concern that the, uh, the insulation on AMS could, uh, as it outgasses for the first couple weeks on orbit, orbit it could uh, contaminate these samples. So uh, the decision was made to, to delay the installment until the flight of Atlantis. And we have a few uh, what we call get-ahead objectives on the EVA. These, these are things that we, uh, if we have time available at the end of the EVA, we will uh, perform. Our top priority get-ahead item is installment of a thermal cover on the PMA3 port that's uh, shown in this graphic. There is uh, the thermal cover would fit over the, the, the mouth of that PMA, and what the purpose of that is to uh, shield a pressure equalization valve on a hatch on PMA3. This hatch, when it's exposed to direct sunlight, overheats and it's degrading the seal life, and it could eventually lead to, to an air leak in, that, uh, in the PMA. So we want to get the, the thermal cover in place to provide a more favorable uh, thermal environment. And another get ahead, uh, if we have time, will be to complete the activation of uh, a uh, power and data grapple fixture on the FGB or Zarya module. This work was, uh, was started on the recent mission STS 134. Uh, a couple of outstanding tasks are to complete the data and power jumper mating so that, we, uh, we can, so that this can become a usable. Uh, base for the station robotic arm. There was also a, a problem identified where a, there appears to be a wire in one of the uh, capture latch doors, and that's shown in the next figure there, cir circled in yellow. Uh, the crew's gonna go in and clear that wire out of the way. Again, so we have a, a new base for the station arm. As you know, the station arm can walk around the station sort of like an inchworm, and it uh, uses these uh, PDGFs as, as basing points where it latches down structurally, and it has electrical and data and command interfaces so that it can be driven from any of those locations. So um, later this morning, you're gonna get a brief from our lead EVA officer, Glenda Brown, and she's gonna fill you in on all the details of the spacewalk. That takes us to the end of flight day five. Flight days six through nine are going to look uh, uh, very similar. Those days are focused on the, the heavy lifting of the, uh, the cargo, moving all the cargo out of the MPLM into the station and then uh, repacking it. That process basically involves uh, every day the crew is going to wake up and, and they'll have received from our teams working overnight, they'll receive a transfer list that tells them specifically uh, which items to transfer, where they're located in the logistics module, where each of those parts go on the station. We keep very careful track uh, of where uh, material is stowed on the station because it's with an internal volume the size of a 747, it's very easy to lose things. Uh, they'll also uh, be performing some maintenance uh, type tasks. Uh, for example, we hope to install the ultrasound and all the, uh, the uh, uh, supporting hardware that goes with that uh, in, the, in the space station. And also a couple of unique items that I'll just call out on flight day six. That's the day where we will perform focused inspection if it's required. Quatsi had mentioned that uh, we'll, we'll perform the, uh, the R-bar pitch maneuver during rendezvous and also the flight day two inspection. If there are any areas of concern, uh, we can go in and uh, on, on flight day six, we can go in and use the orbiter boom sensor system to, uh, to closely inspect any areas of concern and determine whether it's uh, safe to, to land with uh, the damage or whether we need to send the crew out to, to repair it via EVA. Flight days seven and nine will each feature uh, a few hours of off-duty time in the afternoon, and flight day eight will do uh, a resize of one of the spacesuits on the space station and then bring it back in the shuttle to Earth. We'll rotate one of our spacesuits from the space shuttle up to stay on the space station. Flight day nine is our last full day of MPLM cargo transfer. The important thing on that day will be to make sure we've gotten everything off the MPLM to make sure that it's uh, properly loaded with the return cargo. We have uh, literally tons of, tons of cargo coming back 
um, it's important to make sure that we get the right CG and, uh, and loading for that MPLM on the, on the way home. And we're bringing back things such as uh, trash, obsolete parts, uh, equipment that can come back and be refurbished and reflown, uh, as well as science samples. So uh, just to run down some of the numbers there on, on cargo return, we expect the MPLM to weigh uh, 21,500 pounds for the trip home, and our total return complement is uh, 6,300 pounds. And we can go ahead and roll the video, and I'll show you uh, the, the process of uh, unberthing the MPLM uh, towards the middle of flight day nine. Of course, we'll get the hatches closed. Again, Doug and Sandy will be back in the, uh, the cupola. They'll drive the bolts to release the MPLM. And they'll carefully maneuver it into the payload bay of Atlantis. And this, uh, this will actually take place on flight day 10. Also on flight day 10, in addition to restowing the uh, MPLM, we'll be transferring our science samples. We're bringing back a lot of biological uh, samples that need to be kept, uh, kept cold. So those will be coming out of the station freezers and put into to freezers on the, uh, the space shuttle flight deck. And again, flight day 10 is a real busy day just to make sure that all the transfers are done, uh, done correctly. We've got everything on the right side of the hatches. And, uh, and then the crew, crew will say farewell and close the hatches that evening. And with the departure of Atlantis, the, the focus on the station will switch from assembly ops to, uh, to utilization. And um, again, the type of science that we'll be doing on the space station has a lot of applications to, to, to folks on Earth. I mentioned uh, uh, the ultrasound, and we're also uh, uh, examining the effects of, of weightlessness on uh, the immune systems of the astronauts. We've noticed how uh, their immune systems are compromised by space flight. We don't understand the mechanism. It's a very important area of research that uh, will continue on the space station with obvious uh, applications uh, for people on Earth. And again, uh, with our advanced uh, life support system, we're, we're working towards closing the loop to reuse all the water on the space station and not waste anything with our advanced recycle filter tank assembly. We're getting very close to, to being able to, to, to recycle urine indefinitely with uh, very minimal resupplies. And uh, we're already at the point now, we've got uh, uh, carbon dioxide scrubbers that are operational on station that, that require no, no throwaway parts. They're completely regenerable. And that means, uh, for, at least for carbon dioxide and for, for water, we are getting very close to the point where we can leave low Earth orbit and go for an extended time into interplanetary travel uh, uh, while recycling those critical life support uh, uh, functions. And so I'm, I fully expect in the next 30 to 50 years when spaceships are, are, are leaving low Earth orbit, they'll be using the systems that we've demonstrated on the space station. So uh, that's, that's the legacy of the space shuttle, and we're really excited uh, to, to end this mission on a high note. So I'll hand it back to Quatsi for the remainder of the mission. Thank you, Chris. As you can tell from uh, this very thorough uh, description that we do have a lot of work to do during the docked phase, but uh, at the end of flight day 10, the uh, crew of Atlantis will be uh, buttoning up the spacecraft and preparing for undocking the next day. That preparation will include uh, installing the centerline camera uh, into the, uh, the orbiter docking system, as well as maneuvering the uh, orbiter boom sensor system into its undock position and uh, doing the rendezvous tools checkout that'll be required for the next day's uh, undocking and fly around. Very early on flight day 11, Atlantis will uh, release hooks and undock from uh, the International Space Station for the very last time. Uh, she'll perform a, uh, a modified fly around, which uh, we're actually very excited about this. Uh, normally, uh, the, sp the shuttle will undock from the International Space Station and, and uh, fly around the space station taking photographs uh, in the undocking orientation. But what's going to happen this time is uh, Atlantis will hold at about 600 feet away from the space station while the space station performs a 90 degree yaw maneuver. And we have a video that, of what that looks like that we'll show you. What this does for us is this uh, allows us to present uh, a side of the space station that the shuttle does not normally get to see on undock and fly around so that the crew can take high resolution engineering quality photos of sections of the spacecraft that we have not seen before. Uh, on fly around. This will enable us to uh, evaluate other areas of the space station for uh, micrometeoroid and orbital debris impacts, uh, as well as uh, assess the overall health of, of those parts of the uh, spacecraft. 
After that half lap fly around, Atlantis will set and go on her merry way while the ISS maneuvers back to its normal attitude. We'll then uh, prepare for uh, the final TPS inspection uh, of the mission, and that's what we call our late inspection. In this case, the uh, mechanics of the late inspection are uh, identical to that of the, uh, the, the flight day two inspection that you saw uh, earlier, but in this instance we're looking for uh, signs of micrometeoroid and orbital debris damage. And we do have uh, an animation of uh, the late inspection that will show you. Again, much of it should look very familiar in that uh, we're going to use the orbital boom sensor system to uh, start with uh, a, a high resolution scan of the starboard wing, uh, looking for uh, any damage that might have occurred during the docked phases while we were doing all of our uh, logistics and resupply and even during the, uh, the spacewalk. This helps give us a final sense of, uh, of comfort and uh, assurance that uh, Atlantis's TPS or thermal protection system will be in good shape uh, when we prepare for her final uh, deorbit and landing. Uh, we'll inspect the starboard wing first, then the nose cap, and then finally the, uh, the port wing, as well as uh, selected areas uh, around the payload bay doors and uh, the, the umbilical interfaces. Uh, again, looking for any last minute issues that we might need to address before we prepare for, uh, for, for landing. The very next day on flight day 12, uh, the big item that we've got there is the deploy of the uh, Picosat solar cell satellite. Uh, this is a very small, uh, very small satellite. We have a photo of it for you. And essentially, it, uh, it's uh, uh, a, a DOD payload. Uh, we've done these before. Uh, essentially, it's got uh, a series of solar cells uh, that uh, power some antennas and some, uh, some other uh, maneuvering systems on that satellite. We also have an animation of the uh, deployment. Uh, we'll uh, maneuver the shuttle into uh, its deploy altitude and its deploy attitude. Uh, the animation, uh, which we'll show you here very briefly, shows uh, the canister that I illustrated to you earlier. Uh, the satellite will be released from the canister mechanically, uh, float just above the uh, OBSS, and then move away. Following the deployment of that uh, satellite, the uh, shuttle Atlantis will execute a small maneuvering burn to uh, maneuver uh, the shuttle out of the way so that we don't recontact that satellite on the following orbit. And then we'll prepare for uh, our uh, standard uh, landing minus one day activities, which include a checkout of the flight control system, uh, checkout of all of the uh, reaction control system jets. Uh, we'll stow the uh, KU band antenna and basically prepare uh, Atlantis' systems for uh, deorbit and landing, which will occur on flight day 13. Uh, that'll be our final uh, deorbit and landing, hopefully to uh, Kennedy Space Center if the weather holds out. But of course, as always, uh, we have uh, other landing opportunities, which uh, Entry Flight Director uh, Tony Sicacci will, uh, will talk to you about in, in, in the coming days. So in conclusion, uh, we're expecting a very busy mission. Uh, we think it's going to be an exciting mission. Uh, I, there are uh, obviously a, a great sense of, of mixed feelings surrounding this final mission of the Space Shuttle program. Uh, I know I, I personally feel very humbled and, and honored to be part of, uh, of the Space Shuttle program and to be part of this mission in particular. Uh, I was in fourth grade when uh, Space Shuttle Columbia launched on its very first mission, so uh, it's, actually, uh, it's actually quite an honor to be uh, the lead flight director on uh, the last mission of the Space Shuttle program. You know, to me personally, the, the shuttle was one of the things that inspired me to uh, want to focus on math and science while I was in school. Uh, I actually decided when I was in fourth grade after watching the launch of Space Shuttle Columbia that uh, I wanted to be an engineer, and in particular that uh, I wanted to go to, uh, to MIT to study engineering. Of course, many of the managers around here would tell you that uh, I didn't have enough sense to want to go to Texas A&M, but... <laughs> Uh, I think I did okay. Uh, although, uh, although MIT isn't cool enough to get a space shuttle simulator, uh, my alma mater does do the analysis that allows the shuttle to maneuver in space. So for, for me personally, uh, I consider this a great honor. Uh, I consider it a great honor to work with the uh, flight controllers that have been detailed to me on my team. Uh, we have people of diverse backgrounds and, and, uh, and, and diverse skills and capabilities. Uh, they're some of the finest engineers in the country, some of the finest engineers that, that I've worked with, uh, and uh, I can't think of too many more places I would rather be than in the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room uh, leading those troops into uh, a fierce battle with gravity one last time. 
And so uh, we very much appreciate what the uh, shuttle program has done for us, the national capabilities that, uh, that we've gained through it, the knowledge that we've gained through it, and are looking forward to, uh, to transitioning to uh, the next things that, that we'll focus on. Uh, I do not at all in any way, shape, or form view the end of STS-135 and the end of the program as the end of human spaceflight. Uh, I think that that's, you know, would be rather short-sighted of me reflecting on the incredible spacecraft that we've been able to build uh, in the International Space Station. Uh, and we have the capabilities to, uh, to go further with uh, different national visions. Uh, as Mr. Shannon alluded to earlier, uh, there is limited money. And so in, uh, in an era where you have limited money, uh, any, any enterprise, uh, any portfolio of programs that claims to be advancing the cause of human spaceflight uh, is going to be filled with endings and filled with beginnings. And so uh, the challenge really is for us to uh, end in a manner that is respectful of the dedicated professionals that, that have contributed to the cause and uh, to begin in ways that set us up for, uh, for long-term success. So STS-135 is, is, in my view, uh, an important first step in, uh, in an important transition in our national vision for space. And so uh, I'm privileged to be a part of it. Uh, Mr. Edelin and I are, are very much looking forward to uh, getting after it here in a week or so. And uh, at this point, uh, I'll turn it back over to Rob. Thanks, Quatsi. Thanks, Chris. We'll take questions uh, here in Houston. Uh, we'll start over on this side, just sweep across as is customary. And um, then we'll go to the other centers, start off with Bill Harwood. Let's go Harwood, CBS, with two quick ones, I think, uh, both for, well, maybe one for Quatsi and one for Chris. Uh, first, is, is the chance of an extra day a long shot for this mission, or is that something if you get off on time, you think you've got the margin to do? And for Quatsi, um, you know, I think the media is focused on KSC with people losing jobs there because the numbers are bigger. Uh, but obviously, the Space Shuttle Mission Control Room, this is it. And can you give us a sense of what happens to the team that's been supporting shuttle from a mission control standpoint, and, and, and how many of those can transition to station versus just going to have to walk out the door? Okay, those are those are both excellent questions. Uh, I can address both of them. First, a uh, question about the the extra day. The uh, the nominal mission duration for STS-135 is 12 days, uh, and that's not including the the contingency days that we uh, keep in the bank as a reserve uh, to address uh, weather issues uh, or uh, or other systems issues. Now. We are flying with full uh, cryogenic tanks. Uh, our cryogenic oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen tanks are, are used to uh, generate electrical power, which is the limiting consumable that drives how long we can stay on orbit. Based on our analysis and, and based on the power requirements for this mission, uh, we are uh, approximately 80, give or take, uh, kilowatt hours uh, away from having sufficient margin to uh, extend from 12 days to 13 days. Now we've uh, we've assessed some options for uh, for making up that that deficit. Uh, one option that we've uh, discussed with the ISS program and that we've agreed to is that if we do launch on time, we will uh, not power the heaters that are used uh, to keep the MPLM warm uh, in the payload bay. We won't power them. Uh, between flight days one and flight day uh, four where we install the MPLM and we won't power them, power them after we undock the, uh, unberth the, the MPLM uh, and, uh, and bring it home. We've done analysis which suggests that uh, the temperatures can be maintained within acceptable limits without those heaters. Those heaters really uh, provided additional capability and, and redundancy. So by, by not powering those heaters, we're gonna save most of the power that we need to save in order to make up that extra day. The, uh, the remaining deficit, which uh, is to the tune of uh, right around 25 kilowatt hours, uh, we think we can make that up uh, with um, essentially what we call a cryo overload. When we're loading uh, the, the cryogenics, the, the oxygen and hydrogen into Atlantis just prior to launch, uh, typically when we top it off and, and fill it up, uh, there's just that little bit extra that we're able to get in the tanks above and beyond the spec volume of the tanks. We call that sort of our, our cryo overload. And historically, we've seen a consistent trend of how much, uh, how much additional poundage, if you will, of cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen we get. If we get what we have seen typically, our analysis says that that will make up the remaining deficit. So a combination of cryo overload and uh, not powering the MPLM heaters we think that's going to get us there if we launch on time. 
Uh, if we don't get the, the, the cryo overload that we expect, uh, we might be able to make up that deficit with some very modest, uh, modest additional power downs. Again, nothing uh, that's critical that we would need uh, during our travel to and from the space station, but uh, just you know, turning down the lights when we don't need them, uh, that sort of thing, uh, the, the typical type of power conserving measures you would use in your own home. So we think we're actually very close to getting it if we get off on time. Now, what's, the, uh, what's magic about, about getting off on time is uh, with these cryogenics, of course, they are super, super cooled uh, fluids. And even when the, uh, the shuttle's fuel cells are not powered, uh, these fluids don't stay super cooled for long, and, and there's a certain amount that uh, boils off and escapes, if you will. And we know how that process works over time. And so if we launch late, uh, the amount of cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen that's in our tanks, say, a day late or two days late, is uh, measurably less than it was on the very first day that we topped off. So uh, a critical enabler to us getting the extra day is going to be launching on time on July 8th. Uh, but we think we'll, we'll have that. Uh, we think we'll, we'll probably have that in the bank. And what we'll do uh, to assess that is uh, we're not going to commit to the extra day as soon as we launch on time. We're, we're going to uh, get off on time, hopefully. We'll uh, uh, choose not to power the MPLM heaters, as I described for you. And then we'll watch the performance of the electrical system on the shuttle for about a good four days. Uh, just to uh, observe uh, how our margins are increasing. We have very good insight into that. And then we'll make a decision uh, or ask for a decision from the mission management team right around flight day five. Uh, if we have seen the performance that we expect uh, to, uh, to add the additional day. And we'll put the additional day's worth of content uh, in uh, the nominal timeline between flight days eight and flight day nine. And uh, the content of that additional day won't be too uh, won't be too mysterious. It'll be uh, more cargo transfer. Uh, it'll enable us to get down some additional uh, uh, pieces of equipment that we weren't expecting to be able to get down, uh, and uh, and also dispose of some additional trash. So, uh, hopefully, that gives you the the information that uh, that you need about uh, our plans for trying to extract a, an additional day out of the mission. Now, as it pertains to your second question uh, about uh, uh, what's going to happen to the, the, the flight control teams, I, I have a considerable insight into uh, the disposition of, uh, of members of my team. Uh, in addition to staying focused on making sure that this mission is accomplished successfully and with the same diligence and the same vigilance uh, that we've put into uh, prior missions, uh, my, I'd say my, my, my next greatest concern and, and area of focus has been on uh, what's going to happen to, to, uh, to my teammates and uh, making sure that, uh, that they're going to be okay. Um, my observation uh, is that uh, the, uh, the management of our contractors uh, who support the flight control team has uh, spent considerable time and effort to, uh, to assist uh, those individuals who don't have jobs uh, after the end of shuttle, to assist those folks with uh, career development by uh, offering uh, services, career placement services, assistance with building resumes, uh, and, uh, and really uh, providing uh, as much uh, assistance and support uh, as they could. Uh, the feedback I get from members of my team is that, uh, that they, they feel like they have been well helped. Uh, there's a mix of, of, of stories on my flight control team. The people who report to me directly, there are some individuals who uh, right now have already been identified as, uh, as very strong candidates for certain disciplines on the space station flight control team. And uh, they'll have the, uh, the good fortune of transitioning to those jobs uh, right, after, uh, right after we conclude the, the final mission of Atlantis. Uh, there are some members of my flight control team who have uh, actually looked for and found jobs uh, prior to this, uh, this launch. We've had some change out and some turnover uh, uh, on my team in the last uh, six months because there were some folks who, uh, who, who actually had interviewed for jobs and, and they were fortunate enough to get some uh, and, and they started before the, the flight of this mission. We even have some folks on my team who, uh, who have uh, been selected and, and have gotten jobs uh, that they will be able to start after this mission. So they'll, they'll be able to, uh, to carry out STS-135 and after STS-135 they, uh, they, have, uh, they have different jobs outside of NASA and outside of uh, space industry. Uh, to go to and be able to start a new career. And then, of course, on the flip side of the coin, uh, there are individuals who, uh, at this hour, um, do not have uh, specific uh, plans or, uh, or, or, or job prospects 
uh, after we'll stop on STS-135. So there's a mix of, uh, of successes uh, and a mix of, uh, of works in progress with respect to the, uh, the disposition of the, the personnel who are going to be supporting. Tracy. Tracy Watson, USA Today. Can you talk about how the flight day two inspections and the docking will accommodate the smaller crew? What tweaks have you made? Um, where, have you, where have you squeezed out the time and the tasks? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an expression among the, the, the management ranks that there is absolutely no substitute for uh, having really smart people working for you. Uh, the, uh, the, the folks who, uh, who are, are doing the planning for this mission uh, we gave them the challenge early on to, uh, to try to figure out a way, if possible, that we could get this crew to the International Space Station uh, in three days. That was critical because, as you know, Atlantis is not a, uh, um, uh, what we call a Spitz-capable spacecraft, so we, we don't have the capability to feed Atlantis's power systems from the International Space Station, so we have a very limited window of time in which to accomplish this mission. However, we were also flying up uh, one of the heaviest and, and fullest MPLMs that we flew, uh, so getting to, uh, to the space station on flight day three was going to be a critical enabler for the core uh, purpose for which we are, we're flying this mission. Uh, as you've probably heard from us in times past, particularly when we were doing early assessments for STS-133, that in uh, the post-Columbia era where we have all of these TPS inspections that we have to do between launch and docking, uh, with the reduced crew complement, uh, we, we really were struggling to find a way to connect the dots, if you will, in a way that respected all of our constraints for scheduling of the crew day. Uh, what we were able to do was actually find some efficiencies on the day of launch that uh, are not always visible and that, that are, are, are largely unknown to many. Uh, on the crew's launch day, uh, we typically wake the crew up several hours before we begin preparation for them to, uh, to get into the shuttle and, uh, and actually launch. And then after launch, we tend to keep the crew up at about, uh, for about six and a half hours. So, on these missions, typically the crew will go to bed at about six and a half hours after launch, and that, that makes for um, a, uh, a respectable crew day that, that doesn't, doesn't uh, overly tax them. Well, the feedback that we've gotten from recent crews is that this time period between wake up and, uh, and, and uh, earnest preparations for launch, which uh, in their pre-flight timeline is called crew study time, that most of them don't really use it for crew study. Uh, I mean, honestly, with, it, with as, as much as we rehearse these missions and uh, simulate them and train them, uh, the crews uh, usually on the day of launch are, are very well familiar with what they're going to go do. And so they, they, they typically have not utilized this time fully. Our planners had the, the bright idea to, uh, to, to, to basically wake the crew up later and essentially uh, dispose of this, this underutilized time so that we could then keep the crew up in space later and put them to bed uh, at uh, about eight and a half hours, vice six and a half. And so that allows us to accomplish more activities in space while still putting the crew to bed uh, at the same time relative to when they woke up that they normally would go to bed. So it's completely compliant with all of our, our medical requirements for the length of a crew day, but essentially we traded some unused time uh, on the ground for some very badly needed time on orbit, which has allowed uh, this reduced crew size to accomplish all of the critical path activities on flight day one that then had a waterfall effect that enabled us to, uh, to complete all of the activities we needed to complete to rendezvous on flight day three. Questions? Questions? Let's see. Let's go to Marsha here in the middle. Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for Quatsi. Um, you, I was wondering how many total team members do you have that you've been describing? And out of that, what percentage are still without job plans? What happens to you? Do you go back to station ops? And um, are you going to Kennedy for the landing, as so many flight directors have done in the last few flights? Okay, those are all good questions. Uh, I would say the the percentage of uh, of my team members um, who uh, who are contractors that do not have jobs um, after the the mission, I would say that's maybe about a quarter of them, about twenty five percent of them. Uh, 
one of the things that, that, that influences that is that some of my team members are actually civil servants. Uh, most of them are, are contractors, um, but uh, uh, so, uh, many of them are civil servants. So I'd say there's maybe about a quarter of my team right now uh, that are still working on finding jobs for, uh, for, for post-flight. Uh, as far as uh, whether or not uh, whether or not I'm going to go to Kennedy for the landing, uh, that's a good question. Uh, interestingly enough, my, my boss asked me the exact same question two days ago. Uh, I'm still thinking about it, honestly. On the one hand, uh, it, it would be uh, uh, an awesome uh, awesome thing to go to, to Kennedy for, for the landing. And I, I've actually never been to see a shuttle landing. Interestingly enough, I've never seen a shuttle launch. Uh, so uh, uh, that's a great opportunity. Uh, on the flip side, given that this is the last shuttle mission, there's a, a part of me and, and, and those that, that, that know my personality and know me would appreciate this, uh, I, I feel a very strong desire to end my career as a shuttle flight director uh, exactly the way I've lived it, which is in mission control, uh, making myself available to, uh, to be useful uh, if, if needed. And so uh, I'm still thinking about it, honestly. Uh, I don't know. And as far as uh, as far as is, is my expectations for uh, for what I'll be doing after this mission's complete, uh, as as you already know, uh, I actually uh, grew up on the space station side. Uh, although I've had uh, an exciting career as a space shuttle flight director, uh, space station's the vehicle I was born on, if you will. Uh, it's the vehicle I grew up on. I started my flight director career as a space station flight director. Uh, I still support shifts routinely as a space station flight director. So, uh, for me. Um, Personally, the transition is not as stark uh, because, you know, shortly after uh, wheel stop on STS-135, uh, I'll probably see a schedule with, uh, with my name listed on it for uh, an integrated simulation in the space station training room or, uh, or shift in the space, space station flight control room. So uh, as far as transitions, my, my thoughts tend to be centered around uh, the members of my team. Uh, as I said, I, I, uh, when I think about this mission, what I think about the most are those people that I work with, my teammates, uh, those with or without jobs. Um, it's it's the, the thing that fills me with the most pride and, and a sense of satisfaction is being associated with that tremendous group of people. Mark. 25% of how, how many people are you counting in that mix? Total team number. For the people who are detailed to me, um, I'd say on the order of um, a dozen to two dozen, and that and that includes the, the people that you see in the in the in the front room as well as their uh, backroom support personnel. Mark Kirkman, Mark Kirkman, Interspace News. Uh, it's actually for both of you. Um, the since you're going through all the extra trouble of get this extra angle on the uh, undock fly around, uh, what's preventing you from going the full at least the full 360, uh, and what do you lose uh, by not going that extra quarter rev back to the R bar? Thanks. You want to take that? Yeah, the purpose of uh, of doing the modified fly around with the station yawing essentially 90 degrees is to be able to image the sides of station that we don't normally see. So with the shuttle out on the, the front uh, of, the, of the velocity vector starting the fly around, we'll be able to get images of the, the, uh, the plus Y or the, the right hand side, the starboard side of space station. Then as we fly over top uh, to the back side, we'll be able to get pictures of the minus Y or port side of the station. So essentially, uh, we, we, we effectively can image the sides of the station that we're, that we're after on the, uh, the modified fly around. We don't need to spend any additional time uh, uh, flying around the underside. We get plenty of views of the underside of station when we come up to dock. We get plenty of photographic uh, 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 documentation there to look for any damage, as, as Quatsi mentioned. So we can accomplish this in just half a lap. There's no need to spend any more crew time. Uh, flight day 11, the undocking day, is extremely busy, as Quatsi described, because after they undock and do their separation burns, the shuttle crew is going to be jumping into their late inspection to make sure that the, the thermal protection system is safe for landing. So it's a very busy day, and we don't want to we don't want to waste any time. Uh, Philip Sloss with NASASpaceflight.com had a, a couple questions uh, for Mr. Alvarujo first. Um, the uh, ET camera uh, modification that that you're doing. Um, are there any expectations about what we might see downrange um, after Wallops loses the signal from the tank? That's a good question. Um, I think right now we, we don't know what to expect, and, and, and the modifications he's referring to is uh, that the, uh, 
the, the camera that's mounted on the external tank will, will uh, continue transmitting uh, longer than it normally would after it separates from, uh, from, from Atlantis. Uh, we're not going to be looking at that uh, imagery uh, uh, on board Atlantis. Uh, that's going to go straight to ground stations. And uh, I don't think there are uh, uh, any specific expectations about what they'll see. But since we will see images from that camera much longer than we have in the past, we're interested to see what, what we do see. There might be something that we learn from, from, uh, from that imagery. And uh, then for uh, Mr. Edelin, um, could you just, uh, I guess, clarify that uh, you said that the, uh, the uh, MPLM up mass is second heaviest, but that the cargo is the heaviest, if I heard you correctly. Um, is that just a, a difference between Leonardo and Raffaello in terms of their dry weight? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And also, the, uh, it also pertains to the support equipment inside the, the module that holds the cargo. Uh, Jim Oberg with NBC News, for both of you. Uh, you're all looking at the mission, but uh, what kind of thoughts do you have in terms of end of mission ceremonial transfers or events, uh, things you want to make sure you remember, people you make sure you remember at the end? Do you have anything in mind, or are you going to, or are you going to work that out uh, pretty much in real time? Well, that's a good question. Um, of course, at, at the end of this mission, one of the things that's traditional is that uh, we have uh, what we call a plaque hanging ceremony. Uh, in mission control, uh, as, as you've probably seen on cameras, we have plaques that are uh, made in the image of the crew patches for, for the mission and the program patches for the mission. Uh, we award those plaques to the, the individuals or disciplines that we feel uh, most significantly contributed to uh, mission success uh, for, uh, for each, uh, each program, one for shuttle and, and, uh, and, and typically two for, for space station. Um, I think this plaque hanging will be a particularly uh, poignant one. Uh, in that uh, there'll be uh, certainly a lot of emotion uh, that, uh, that I think will be surrounding uh, the, the final space shuttle, space station assembly uh, plaque hanging. There will be other ceremonies like that. Uh, as, we, as I said before, uh, we, we are certainly not ending human spaceflight, uh, contrary to what some have, have said. Uh, the space station will continue, uh, continue missions. There'll, there'll, there'll be a continuation of uh, resupply missions as well as crewed missions to the space station and, and the, the traditional ceremonies that go along with that. Um, but uh, I think that the, the focus will be to uh, make sure that we appropriately honor those people who uh, have not only contributed to this mission, but uh, to uh, respectfully honor the contributions of those who've enabled uh, the success of the shuttle program uh, all the things that we've learned uh, in the shuttle program. Uh, you know, the, the capabilities that NASA has today, and when I talk about capabilities, I'm talking about capabilities of knowledge, things that we know how to do. Uh, these capabilities are the result of, of fiscal investments that have been made in these programs. Uh, and they're also the, the, the result of investment of uh, lives and life's work. And so uh, the focus will really be on, on appropriately honoring that and uh, the people who contributed. Uh, as far as additional uh, ceremonies, uh, I think um, there will be, uh, there'll be uh, uh, many more that, that we'll do in the coming days. Uh, one thing that, that I think is, is worth emphasizing is that this team uh, and the people here at Johnson Space Center have not been tremendously focused on this flight as the last flight. Uh, the prevailing sense that I get from all of the people supporting this mission, from uh, the program office personnel who are, are, are putting together the requirements and, and making sure that the hardware is, is fit, uh, to the people on my flight control team who are preparing to execute this mission. The prevailing sense and the, and the prevailing desire is to fly this mission safely and successfully because we think that is, that is the most powerful legacy that we could leave uh, for this program. And so, uh, you know, one of the side effects of that is that we, we really haven't thought as much uh, about uh, commemorating lasts and finals and uh, ends as, uh, as you might think. Alan? Alan Boyle with MSNBC. Uh, I wanted to ask how the flight directors will transition to the commercial uh, resupply and eventually crew transfer uh, era. Is there going to be a fundamental change in the way that you're going to be doing your job or in the way that your teams are going to be organized? That's a great question. And uh, 
I, let me apologize in advance for, for the answer, but it, it does have the, the tremendous virtue of being true, which is, uh, I don't know. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't gotten far enough along in uh, the development of those programs for there to exist a, a cogent answer to that question. Uh, what I can tell you, though, is that uh, we have a very strong flight director core. Uh, the vast majority of us are, uh, are qualified on uh, International Space Station. Uh, most of our, our, our space shuttle flight directors, minus, uh, minus two or three, uh, are, are also space station flight directors. So for us, we will continue to serve in the role that we've historically played uh, with respect to the International Space Station program and also um, serve in, in leadership roles leading the development of, of the operational philosophies and the interfaces uh, to the uh, commercial providers. As far as who will, uh, who will actually provide tactical, real-time command and control of, uh, of, and, and operations of uh, those spacecraft, you know, those are things that I think are still being discussed, and, and there, there are a variety of models that, that may work. And uh, I think if you ask that same question again in another year, you'll probably get uh, a more detailed answer to that. Right. Just quickly, does the Russian mission control model provide one of those models? Would it work uh, that way where you have separate commercial and uh, space station, for example, mission controls? Uh, I think uh, I think the Russian uh, the Russian flight control model is uh, is one model certainly. Uh, in in my personal uh, personal experience uh, working with the Russian teams, there are some uh, some some obvious strengths of that model. It, it seems to work for them, um, but uh, you know it, it might may or may not be the right right tool for for this set of companies with with. Uh, our culture and uh, and our capabilities and and our uh, our core rigidities, uh, so uh, that's something that that, that folks are going to be looking at. Uh, the Russian model does provide us an example to evaluate, um, but I, I'm not 100% con convinced that it'll evolve. Uh, it'll evolve to look exactly the way the Russian teams look. Additional questions here. Uh, let's go in the front, Denise, and then Gina. Uh, Denise Chow at space.com. Um, just to follow up with Tracy's question, um, because there are only four members of the shuttle crew, are you anticipating that they'll have or face a lot more stress or pressure, not just on inspection and docking days, but for the, the rest of the mission with the cargo transfers and everything? Okay. Question about uh, additional stress and pressure because of the reduced, reduced crew size. Uh, one thing that, that I've observed from this crew, uh, in addition to their, their incredible uh, resumes and, and portfolio of skills, uh, is this is a crew that works very, very well together. Uh, I tell you, just as, uh, as, as far as the personalities involved, uh, this is a, a very, um, this, this is a crew that, that's got, uh, I believe, an incredible uh, joie de vivre, if you will. Uh, they enjoy what they do. Uh, they enjoy working together. They enjoy each other. And so uh, what I've been most impressed with uh, from this crew is uh, how they've uh, examined all of the challenges that, that, that they have. Uh, and uh, they've simply uh, put their intellects and their skills uh, to work at finding solutions and, and, uh, to those problems and, and mitigating those challenges. Uh, as I've, I've worked very closely with uh, Commander Chris Ferguson uh, over the last uh, several months, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's great at highlighting to me uh, issues and things that they are concerned about, um, but uh, he doesn't very easily display uh, worry in the traditional sense that you may think of people worrying. Uh, so this is a very confident crew, they're very competent, and uh, we're going to do our part on the ground to, uh, to keep things as, uh, uh, as stable for them as possible so that they can field the challenges of this mission even though there are fewer number of them. Uh, and I believe they're really going to be—they're uh, really going to be fine, and they're going to do—they're going to do great. I've got uh, just tremendous admiration and respect for for this crew. Gina. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Chris. Two questions. Um, got a lot of stuff going back and forth. So, what was your secret? Post-it notes, barcode scanners. How do you keep track of everything going back and forth? Well, we use color coding. Believe it or not. The things that, uh, that are to go up into the space station and be left there are typically colored with a yellow label. The crew remembers that. By yellow means it goes towards the sun. And the items to be brought back to Earth are, have a green label going back to the grass. Uh, the food, that was done by a different, different group, and it's blue labeled. But uh, we all know all the food is going to end up on the station 
Uh, so uh, the, the colors help the crew to, uh, to keep track of where things go. Each item is also labeled with specific uh, location label codes and part numbers and serial numbers. And we keep track of all that in a database. That's one of the functions we perform here in, uh, in Mission Control Houston, keeping track of where everything is located. And, and we'll follow closely what their crew reports at the end of the day. Sandy Magnus will, will call down and, and report which items in her transfer list were stowed. We have the same list on the ground. And we'll enter all that into the, into the database. And. Uh and for Chris, I imagine that uh, you know it was very competitive getting something on the going up list. Was there anything that you would have liked to have gotten on that list that you didn't? Was there a last call for ideas? You know, actually, the you know food is always something we need more of. Um, but the the space station program actually did a phenomenal job because when this mission was first identified as being a you know this was really going to happen, that was about nine months ago. Um, it, initially, the folks in the space station program said, we can't possibly have enough cargo to fill up uh, a logistics module. We just can't get it together in time because you know, the spare parts have to be manufactured and inspected. The food has to be produced. And, and there's a long supply chain that has to take place. And the material has to, you know, it can't be ready just on launch day. You can see that it, you know, from, from the, the video there of the work at Kennedy Space Center, it takes several months to load up an MPLM and it has, you know, the, the Cargo has to be processed even before that. So it was a huge challenge in the space station program, really, really rose to the occasion. And Mike Suffordini is very pleased that we were able to literally fill up the MPLM. It's, it's as full as it can be, if, as you saw from that video. Any last questions? Uh, we'll take one more from Irene, then close it out. Thanks. Irene Klotz with Reuters uh, for either one of you would like to answer this. Um, what, what's your biggest concern about not having shuttle for station logistics support? Well, the biggest concern about not having the, the shuttle available in the future is, is the, the unique capabilities that the shuttle provides, bringing up really big stuff, big spares that can't fit, for example, in the, uh, the trunk, which, which is the, uh, the external stowage location of a SpaceX Dragon, for example, or uh, you know, the items that come up on a Progress freighter. Those have to fit through the, the relatively small Russian hatch. So uh, uh, that, that's the big concern, is, is bringing up uh, large spare parts and also, uh, the shuttle provides a lot of down mass capability. Uh, I, I described how we are bringing back uh, over 6,000 pounds of cargo on, on the shuttle return. Now, uh, these concerns have been addressed through the design of our, uh, uh, the other robotic spacecraft that will be servicing space station. I mentioned that SpaceX can, can carry uh, moderate sized spares in its trunk. The, uh, the Japanese HTV also has an external cargo platform, it can bring up spares. And we've also you know, made a strong effort on the station program to pre-position lots of spares. For example, that, f that the pump module that failed, we have three pump modules already up on the outside of station um, stored as spares, and we'll plug them in as, as needed. So, so we've, we've really looked ahead to try to see what capabilities we lose with the shuttle and, uh, and to try to adapt to that. OK, that'll wrap up the questions, uh, or actually, no more? One more. Just one more. Uh, Philip okay. Sloss with NASASpaceflight.com again. Uh, just to follow uh, Denise's uh, question earlier, it, is there anything that the, the flight control team can do on the ground to reduce some of the crew uh, uh, work uh, on orbit? Well, there's, uh, there, there, there are a few things. The first uh, and most important thing that we can do to reduce some of the crew work is to uh, make sure that the procedures and, uh, and uh, documentation that the crew has are correct. Uh, rework, you know, is 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 a is a fact of complex space flight. But minimizing that would really really help the crew. Uh, my flight control team has done a great job of, uh, of of looking at things that might need to be different in our procedures as a result of the reduced crew complement. And uh, I think we've got a, a pretty good handle on that. Uh, on the space station side, uh, one of the great things about space station is that. Uh, those core spacecraft systems are largely operated by the mission control team, and so uh, offloading the crew from a lot of the uh, systems commanding and systems operation that they have to do uh, with the core spacecraft systems that also uh, that also helps quite a bit. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that that one of my flight controllers is going to do, uh, my my communications and instrumentation officer, uh, she's going to uh, operate all of the uh, the cameras 
for the crew many times the crew would pan and tilt their cameras as they're doing their robotics tasks for unbirthing the MPLM or maneuvering space suited crew members from one part of the space station to another. We're going to run the cameras for them again to essentially provide an extra set of hands from the ground. So these are just a few things that we'll be able to do. All right, great. That closes out the questions for today. Quatsi, Chris, thanks very much. Uh, just a couple of programming notes before we close. Coming up next on NASA television, uh, the NASA TV video file out of headquarters with agency-wide news and video. And then that'll be followed at uh, noon Central Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time by the STS-135 Spacewalk Overview Briefing. An hour after that at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 Eastern, the final pre-launch news conference for Atlantis's four astronauts. So you'll want to stay tuned for that. You can follow everything associated with the final flight of the space shuttle on our website at www.nasa.gov. Stay tuned as coverage of the STS-135 pre-flight briefings continues on NASA television. Thanks very much.